you knock on the huge old oak door. An old lady answers and welcomes you in. She takes you around for a tour of the ancient manor house. She shows you each room and tells you of the horrors of the past that have taken place in the house. She takes you into the great hall and then guides you upstairs. In the first room, you feel uneasy as she tells you about the ghost of a cavalier that appears in the window. You go back into the corridor and into the next room and you notice the smell of lavender and are overwhelmed by sadness. She then tells you about a young girl who was abused and murdered in that room. You follow the old lady back to the old oak door that you entered when you arrived at the house. As you leave, you look back into the window of the great hall and the old lady waves at you. Then you notice that she fades away. You have just experienced one of the many ghosts of Chingle Hall. Chingle Hall is an ancient manor house that was once a sanctuary for Roman Catholics in a time when it was illegal to take mass and punishment usually meant death. Welcome to Ghost Tales by the Fireside. In this episode, I'll be telling the history and horrors of Chingle Hall in Goosna. After the Battle of Hastings in 1066, the land where Chingle Hall stands was owned by Uhtred de Singleton. By 1260, a descendant of Uhtred's, Adam de Singleton, built a small moated manor house and named it Singleton Hall. Chingle Hall stands in the village of Goosna, seven miles from Preston in Lancashire. Goosna was mentioned in the Doomsday Book as Gusenthag, which is a combination of Old Irish and Scandinavian, meaning shealing or hill pasture of a man called Gusan. Gusna and nearby Trelfell and Newsham were lands held by Earl Tostig as part of his lordship of Preston. The land contained one caracute of land, which is around 120 acres and a basic unit of taxation and originally the amount of land that a team of eight oxen could plough each year. Chingle Hall is a Grade II listed building and a scheduled monument. It first appeared in a document as Singleton Hall in 1354, when it was held by Robert Singleton, son of Adam Singleton, the builder of the manor house. It is one of the oldest brick buildings in the United Kingdom and some of the ceiling timbers have Viking runes carved into them, suggesting that they came from a Viking longship, which was a common practice in those days. There are various cavities in the walls of the house that are known as priest holes hiding places for priests from a time when it was illegal to practice mass in England. These priest holes are believed to be the work of Nicholas Owen, famous across the country for installing priest holes in many estate homes, including Coton Court, home to the Throckmorton family, and Harvington Hall near Kidderminster. Nicholas Owen was a Jesuit lay brother during the reigns of Queen Elizabeth I and James I of England. After his arrest for being behind the installation of the priest halls, he was tortured to death in the Tower of London in March 1606. The Reformation of 1532 transformed an entirely Catholic nation into a predominantly Protestant one. The first church in Goosna was dedicated to St. Mary the Virgin and from 1539 was no longer allowed to hold mass. 
the Catholic people had no choice but to hold mass in secret chapels in fear of discovery. Being a Catholic family, the Singletons used Jingle Hall to hold mass and had two priest hides installed. One that was discovered in 1970 after Mrs. Howarth, who lived in Jingle Hall from the 1950s, noticed smoke coming from the ceiling in the chapel area. She called the fire brigade, who found that one of the structural timbers in one of the walls was burning from the inside out. It extinguished itself as quick as it lit. Where the fire brigade had to knock a hole in the wall, it revealed one of the priest holes. The other priest hole is located in one of the rooms upstairs. One night, some visitors to the hall could hear what sounded like bricks being moved coming from upstairs. When looking into the priest holes the next morning, they could see that some of the bricks had been moved and placed on the floor. One notable person from Chingle Hall was Robert Singleton, who was chaplain to Henry VIII's second wife, Anne Boleyn. In 1516, Robert Singleton was the vicar of Preston. To further his career, he went to Oxford and then Cambridge, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Canon Law in 1522. By 1533, he joined the circle of avant-garde evangelicals who gathered at the margins of Tudor Court under the patronage of Thomas Cromwell. On the 2nd of April, 1535, he gave a notable sermon at Paul's Cross. Paul's Cross was an open-air pulpit in the precincts of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which was the most influential of all public venues in medieval England. On Relic Sunday, 8th of July, 1543, Robert was recorded as speaking undeclosed words of heresy at Paul's Cross and was sentenced and executed at Tyburn on the 7th of March, 1544, for stirring up a crowd to rebel against the newfound Protestant Church led by Henry VIII. It is believed that Robert Singleton was not guilty of this charge, but that he was maliciously slandered. Robert was once involved in a murder scandal and was believed to have been the murderer of Robert Packington, but it was dismissed. Robert Packington was a wealthy merchant who was murdered outside of his house at Cheapside in London, as he left to attend mass at the 13th century church of St. Thomas of Acre, which he attended each day without fail. His murderer is still a mystery. The Catholic martyr St. John Wall is believed to have been born at Chingle Hall in 1620. He became a priest in 1641 and he allegedly used Chingle Hall as a place to worship during the Catholic Reformation on his return from Rome in 1656, where he settled in Harvington Hall in Chaddesley Corbett, Worcestershire. Another Catholic household, well known for its many priest holes, built by the infamous Nicholas Owen. After 22 years of ministry to the Catholics of the area, he was captured at Rushock Court near Bromsgrove in 1678. He was taken to Worcester Jail, where he was offered his life if he would forsake his religion, which he declined. John Wall was hung, drawn and quartered at Red Hill on the 22nd of August, 1679. His quartered body was buried in St. Oswald's churchyard and Mr. Levinson, however, allegedly acquired his head and it became a holy relic at Worcester until the dissolution, when it was removed and sent to France. His head is said to have returned to England and buried within the lands of Chingle Hall. John Wall was canonised by Pope John Paul VI in 1970. Legend has it, that during the Battle of Preston in 1648, Oliver Cromwell visited the hall and climbed one of its chimneys to spy on the Royalists below. It is also believed that he left his axe mark on the door, 
the Marquis would leave to show his men that Catholic Mass was being practiced in the building. Chingle Hall stayed within the Singleton family until 1585, when Eleanor Singleton, the last in line, died. It then passed to the Wall family through the marriage of William Wall and Anne Singleton, who passed it on to their son, Anthony Wall, the mayor of Preston, who died in the Hall in 1601. The Wall family owned the house until the mid-18th century, when the house passed to a local branch of the Singleton family. From 1794, it was owned by the Farrington family for around 100 years, and then bought by the Longton family. In 1945, the house was rented to the Howarth family, who bought the house in 1960. After the death of the Howarths, the house stood empty for numerous years, until 1986, when Sandra and John Copleston Bruce bought and restored the hall. The modest manor house of Chingle Hall became a working farmhouse between the 17th century to the early part of the 20th century. When Margaret Howarth lived at Chingle Hall from the 1950s, she led a very social life. Legend says that she loved Chingle Hall so much that she has never left, despite her being dead. It is thought that Mrs Howarth is the grey lady that makes an appearance on occasions. A young couple were visiting the area and heard about Chingle Hall whilst in the local pub. They wanted to visit the hall, so they knocked the door. The door was answered by a little old lady, and they asked her if it would be okay for them to have a look around, as they'd heard so much about the place. She told them to come in and took them for a tour of the house, explaining in detail about the history and the ghost stories in each room. When they finished, they were about to leave, and the old lady said that her name was Mrs Howarth. After leaving Chingle Hall, they returned to the pub that they were in on the previous night. They started telling the locals that they'd been to Chingle Hall, and that Mrs Howarth was a charming old lady and was very kind to show them around the house. They were then told by one of the pub's customers that Mrs Howarth had died 12 months ago. Chingle Hall became very popular with tourists during the 1990s, so a tour guide was employed to show people around. A group of tourists from New Zealand were taken around the hall. One of the party noticed a white figure that seemed to be wearing a habit standing against the wall. She told the rest of the group and they all saw it. They said that they couldn't see his features and his hand was up against his face, as if he was guarding it. The same guide saw a monk in the doorway of the John War Room. He was described as being around five feet tall and wearing a white habit. Five feet tall would be an average height in the past, some people even smaller. In 1980, Terry Whitaker set up some recording equipment to see if he could record any paranormal sounds for a local radio show. It was around 12.40 a.m and he and his colleague could hear the sound of footsteps in the corridor upstairs. They both rushed up to take a look, and they could see the floorboards moving as if someone was walking across them. They followed the footsteps to the end of the corridor. When they came to the end, they looked up and saw a hooded figure that looked like a monk, with his arms tucked inside of his sleeves. They said that he was solid looking, not transparent, as you would imagine a ghost to look. After around 30 seconds, he drifted towards a huge cupboard and straight into the wall. They later found out that behind the cupboard was the entrance to a priest hole. They'd been recording the radio show for 12 weeks and hadn't experienced anything until that night. A central heating engineer was working in the house. After working for two or three days, he was getting behind in his work, so he asked another engineer to go with him 
and help him finish the job. In the Great Hall, he had plumbed in a new central heating system, which just needed to be connected. He looked at the job to see what needed to be finished and went to tell his colleague that it just needed to be connected to the boiler and to go with him so that he could show him the correct pipes to connect. When they got to the heater, there were no pipes at all. All of the pipe work had gone. They went to tell the owner about it to see if she knew what had happened. She went with them to look for herself and all of the pipes were back in place like they hadn't been touched. A news producer attended the hall to film an article about a charity event that was being held there. What he thought would be a fun evening turned out to be a nightmare. Eight nurses were on a sponsored sitting overnight in the house. It started out as fun, but it turned nasty. They were all sitting in the John Wall room, which has the reputation of being the most haunted room in the house. One of the nurses was a complete skeptic, but she said that she could see someone stood behind one of the other nurses above her shoulder. The nurse on the right hand side said that she could feel someone stood there, but didn't see them. The other nurses said that they could see a figure in a hood standing over her. After the death of her parents in the 16th century, Eleanor Singleton became the new owner of Chingle Hall at the very young age of six and would be the last in line of the Singletons to be in possession of the property. She was took into the so-called care of her two uncles who are rumoured to have locked her up in the room where she was the victim of sexual abuse from them until the end of her short life at the age of 18. It is alleged that she became pregnant numerous times by the uncles and many of the children were still born. She gave birth to four living babies who were all murdered by the uncles. The last baby being a hydrocephalic child with an enormous head, which was the cause of Eleanor's death in 1585. Many people have said that they have felt the emotional trauma in the room as if it has been locked into the atmosphere. Many have also had an overwhelming rush of emotion when walking into the room, breaking down into tears and feeling faint, and have needed to be helped out of the hall. The fragrance of lavender is often smelled in the room, which is believed to have been Eleanor's favourite aroma. Over the years, Chingle Hall was a favourite for paranormal investigators, until the hall was sold when the new owners closed the door to the public. A group of paranormal investigators decided to hold a seance in the Great Hall. One of the team members said that he felt a cold shiver down his back. Not long afterwards, his back warmed up again, but he felt a tremendous pressure on his back, as if someone was pushing him from behind, and he had to push himself against it. He said that it felt like it went straight through his body and came out through the front. He felt a great relief, but had a gasp for breath. As it left him, two of the other team members experienced the same thing. Afterwards, they all said that they felt an overwhelming feeling of sadness and that they all burst into tears. Throughout the night, the group tried out different experiments. One of these experiments involved just sitting in the Great Hall in silence to listen out for any unusual sounds. They heard the sound of chanting that was unmistakably in Latin, and they could feel an oppression in the room. One of the team felt so scared that she had to leave. She described that it felt like something terrible had happened to her, and it had been captured for a moment. They were sat in a circle when one of the team shot forwards. Her face was pure white, as if the blood had been drained from her. They all said that they could feel a psychic breeze, as if someone was walking around and in between them all. After it stopped, there was a loud bang on the front door that was so hard it shook the whole house. After opening the door, there was no one there. Late one night, an investigator was in the Great Hall 
and heard a crashing type of noise coming from the main front entrance area. He opened the door towards the chapel and shined his torch. To his amazement, he witnessed a chair physically moving on its own, rocking back and forth and side to side, banging on the hard stone floor violently. He shouted for his friend to see it. His friend rushed to the chapel, turned the light on, and he witnessed it too for about a minute before it stopped. There was once a dog show on the car park of the hall. One of the guests asked where the local monastery was, as they'd like to visit. When it was explained that there isn't a monastery, she asked why monks had been coming out of the house, across the bridge, and walking off into the distance. In the early 2000s, a group of 10 paranormal investigators, made up of people from all over the United Kingdom, held a vigil in Shingle Hall over a whole weekend. Three of the team were the first ones to walk in following the guide. They were saying how it felt so welcoming and was very homely. When they felt a person barge between them and heard a woman saying, shush. But they couldn't see anyone there. After a brief tour of the property, the investigation began. They were in the Great Hall, discussing plans for the night, when they could hear a loud banging noise coming from upstairs. On inspection, they found that it was just trapped air in the central heating system, causing a pipe to hit against the wall. The group leader wanted to try an experiment using trigger objects scattered around the upstairs, while they were downstairs. The experiment involved putting coins on small pieces of card and drawing around the coins, placing them in various places and checking them at a later time to see if any of them had moved. As he was handing the coins out to another member, he suddenly received a small cut on the back of his hand. This was in the John Ward room, where it is a well-known haunt of a cavalier. There are two cavities in the wall of the John Ward room, that were once feed holes for the chains that raised and lowered the drawbridge. They held an EVP session in that room and placed the recording devices inside the two cavities, pressed record and went back downstairs. After an hour, they retrieved the recording devices and examined them to see if they had recorded anything significant. To their amazement, they heard the sounds of a church bell ringing, a baby crying, and a chain rattling. At 11pm, they took a break and sat around the dining room table in the Great Hall. The group leader was cleaning the lenses of his camera, when his chair was pulled backwards, throwing him against the wall behind him, as if an invisible force had pulled him across the room, travelling about a metre. After the break, they held a seance while sitting at the dining table, when within minutes the table lifted for about 30 seconds and then suddenly dropped, with no possible way any of the group could have lifted it. During the seance, they all witnessed a foggy silhouette walk through the door near the private part of the house. It walked across the room and through the door towards the chapel. They could all see the shape of his head and shoulders. As there had been many sightings outside of the hall, they decided to investigate. Upon going outside, a few members of the team said that they saw three children running around the trees near the car park. Nothing was caught on camera until walking around the gardens at the back of the property, when they captured a series of photos of what looked like a woman in a white dress walking up the lawn. Another photo was taken towards one of the small windows and they could see a candle was lit when the photo was developed, but there wasn't a candle in the holder during the night. Jingle Hall isn't open to the public anymore. The recent owners decided to close it to the public. Please log into the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash ghost house podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash ghost house podcast.
forward slash ghost tales podcast this podcast will be out monthly and is available on most platforms all music research writing production art and sound effects are my own work <laughs> <laughs>